Right, thanks. Uh, so today it's more on shift photocurrent. Uh, yeah, again, uh, thanks for coming. We know it's the last day of the, of the school. We are all tired, uh, we learn a lot, but let's try to learn a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I really, uh, talking about the shift photocurrent, we saw it yesterday, uh, John also mentioned it. It's a second order process that contributes to the DC um, photocurrent. And we'll study a bit how this is computed in actual calculations when we want to uh, estimate it in real materials. So you uh, saw yesterday in the tutorial in the afternoon, um, this can be computed in the Vanier code. It's also available in the Vanier 90 code. So today we'll uh, see a bit how um, this is computed by the so-called Vanier interpolation method. Uh, this was already mentioned by David in his talk, but he had many things to talk about. So today we'll try to pay a bit more attention uh, to that and uh, see it in a bit more detailed way. And then we'll uh, check out a couple of examples that uh, we found it interesting recently. Okay, so let's go. Yeah, so this was introduced yesterday, so I'll be brief. Um, the shift current is a particular contribution to a more general effect that is called the bulk photovoltaic effect. This is now a nonlinear light absorption process that takes place in non centrosymmetric crystals. We saw yesterday why. This is a second order process, at least in the uh, first approximation. And experimentally, it can lead to very large photovoltages, actually above the band gap. So that makes it a bit different from the um, uh, standard linear uh, photovoltaic effect because it's fundamentally different. This was studied heavily during the 70s and 80s, but it's now kind of a new push, um, renewed interest, partly because possible applications uh, in solar cells. Um, I don't think this uh, bulk photovoltaic effect will end up substituting the current solar cells, but it could be that it could complement uh, the ones that we uh, have right now in some or other way. Now, uh, we saw this yesterday, but let's um, check the cartoon image again. In usual photovoltaics, well, we always think of silicon, right? So when an electron is excited in silicon, because it's uh, centrosymmetric, it kind of doesn't know where to go, so you have to drive it to, to your electrode. And this is usually achieved via this uh, PN junction. So the interface drives the electron. The nice thing about bulk photovoltaics is that it's one homogeneous material with broken inversion symmetry, and the broken inversion symmetry does the job for you um, for conducting uh, the electron to your electrodes. Okay, so I inserted here one of the early measurements of the effect to illustrate how a um, spectrum of a shift, well, shift current or a bulk photovoltaic effect can look like. So this is barium titanate, it's a ferroelectric, so a lot of interest was in ferroelectrics back then. Um, so the authors highlight that the open circuit photovoltage exceeds the value of the band gap, and light polarized parallel and perpendicular to the C-axis, respectively, produces photovoltages with opposite sign. So this tells us that depending on the polarization, the direction of polarization of the light, you can obtain photovoltage or photocurrent if you close the circuit in one direction or the other. This is uh, visible in the spectrum, uh, where we have plus and minus, um, currents, and know that for even for a given um, component, you can switch sign depending on frequency. So in this sense, it's an effect that gives you more freedom than the standard uh, photovoltaic effect. It's just that um, the light absorption process turns out not to be super efficient uh, as compared to the, um, to the standard case. And there is a lot of work going on right uh, now on there. Now, why is there a recent interest now in the field again? Well, we saw yesterday that partly it's because of fundamental reasons. So there is a close connection to topology. In this case, uh, the shift current we saw yesterday cannot be uh, directly connected to any topological invariant, to very curvature or so on. But still, uh, it has topological or geometrical fingerprints and nice and interesting things uh, happen around that. But it's not only uh, fundamental, there is also uh, interest, there is also 
applied interest going on uh, and pushing the field. So I like to show this example because it's uh, ab initio calculations that um, kind of suggested that in, if you go, if you decrease the dimension of your sample, if you go to 2D, the shift contribution to the bulk photovoltaic effect can be greatly enhanced. So th this is shown in this figure. Um, this is the photoconductivity, and we take into account that typical bulk values in units of uh, um, microampere per volt square are on the order of 10. Whereas uh, the authors obtain that for due to the strong Van, Van Hoff singularities, you can obtain as much as an order of magnitude enhancement in the photo, photoconductivity. And this was also nicely emphasized in, in, this, uh, in this work. Um, also around this example of uh, 2D materials, I, uh, this is an example I like very much. This is a recent experiment on nanotubes that you can think of, of as a bridge between a purely 3D and a 2D material because this is uh, rolled uh, monolayers at the end. So the authors studied uh, tungsten disulfide nanotubes, if I'm not uh, wrong, and they found that um, the photocurrent that they achieve, it's very large, it's on the order of nanoamperes. Um, well, I will explain a little bit, just a little bit how uh, this works. So the measurements are done here, so in order to, these are the contacts, so in order to um, see what's the intrinsic bulk photovoltaic effect, we have to look in the middle of these plots. So for the monolayer, although from inversion symmet uh, from symmetry arguments in principle, they could uh, measure some, um, possibly some current, they do not measure a substantial current in the middle, but with the same material, if they roll it, then they get uh, several orders of magnitude enhancement in the measured um, photocurrent in the nanotubes. <coughs> Another example that um, is also um, kicking hard in the field is that of uh, the shift current in vile semi-metals. So this is, again, an experiment that was done a few years ago. And in this case, the figure of merit, this uh, glass coefficient that um, um, kind of describes how uh, efficiently your system can um, absorb light and uh, turn it into a current, you see that the figure of merit for tantalum arsenide that was um, experimentally measured goes far above all the previous existing uh, ferroelectrics and, and other type of materials. So it seems that vile semi-metals have also uh, enhanced contribution to the bulk photovoltaic effect. And there are many more examples. I won't go through all of them, but just to give you a quick overview. So people is really trying to push this um, uh, drawback of the efficiency, efficiency um, on, trying to get more and more efficient um, materials. Uh, it's, I, I heard that it's not easy, but they are still trying. Uh, there is also a nice connection to magnetism that uh, one can uh, do, and this field is also now starting to grow. And you can even think of doing strange things to your material, like bending. So uh, you can imagine that you have an inversion symmetric material, but you apply some force, a needle, deform it, and try to measure whether this deformation that breaks locally inversion can lead to some measurable effect. And that's the, uh, what the authors call the flexophotovoltaic uh, effect. OK, so that was the overview. Uh, I guess no questions in the motivation. So let's um, go with the first bit, um, by interpolation of the shift photocurrent. So we get into expressions now. So we saw the expression for the photocurrent already yesterday. Um, now I've written the matrix elements, the transition matrix elements for the shift photocurrent in a slightly different way. Yesterday we saw uh, a quantity called the shift vector that allows um, maybe a more clear interpretation, but it turns out that for computational purposes, and I also like it more, you can also rewrite the matrix element as the dipole term times what's uh, now a covariant derivative. So that's the, it, it involves the k derivative of the dipole, of the full dipole, not only the phase, and we've got here what we saw yesterday, the, the very connections. 
The troublesome quantity is this bit, because we need to now start taking k derivatives of this quantity that we know it's uh, sensitive to the uh, k space phase and has to be treated carefully. So let's review what have been the, the approaches when one really wants to get to compute it in real materials, how people have uh, tried to do it in the past and how uh, we do it. So there are, on one hand, there are some rule expressions. So one can express this type of covariant derivatives uh, as a sum over uh, states which involves only the dipole. Now this has the advantage that dipole we usually know how to compute, but it has one drawback, and it's not small, that it's an unbounded sum over virtual states. So if you want to converge it, and this is very much material dependent, you need to sum over all virtual states. So this means that if you are doing ab initio calculations, you need to um, compute a lot of empty states. You never know how many, so, and that starts to become, or can start to become um, time demanding, especially if you are interested in a system that is um, yeah, uh, not trivial in the sense of, a, you can think of a nanotube if you want to compute many, many uh, states in a big cell computationally that uh, starts to com uh, become computationally very expensive. Uh, a nice thing, though, of this type of sum rules is that they are amenable to uh, the time mining formulation. We already saw yesterday that um, um, neat expression for the for the shift current uh, in tight binding models. This is achieved. This was achieved in this paper, applying cleverly applying these uh, sum rules to this type of terms. Then the I thing was the group of Henry Rapp that um, put forward uh, the implementation of uh, a discretized expression of the uh, Berry connection. So we know that the Berry um, or the dipole um, matrix element. So we know that it, that it is written in terms of the periodic part of the block functions, and there is the k derivative there. So one can um, write it as, uh, in this case, that's a discretized expression, so one takes k points and near, uh, nearby k points and just compute this type of overlap matrices. Now, this would allow to do it without uh, any truncation error, because you are actually computing what's the um, norm between uh, the wave function at different k points that does the job for you. But, and it was applied uh, very successfully for uh, the case of barium titanate. You see here, um, DFT calculations are, let's see, DFT calculations are in solid line for the different components, and these are the experimental values. Then I think that the dashed area, it's, um, well, kind of the uncertainty on the experimental parameters that they then plug in their calculations. So, in principle, they are covering all this area. And you see that it kind of very nicely reproduces not only the magnitude, but also the trends when it goes from uh, positive to negative. So uh, this was a great achievement. The drawback of this uh, procedure is that without any more um, care, you need to compute all the k points ab initio. Um, all those k points you need to um, compute in a non self consistent way, which means that for certain materials, if the integral is going to be uh, tough to converge, it will again be uh, quite time demanding. So, um, all right, and I wanted to mention the same authors very uh, recently have recalculated, the, they have come back to the problem and added. Um, a phonon-assisted ballistic current to, to the shift, so this could now include some recombination process due to electron-phonon interaction, and, well, they see some changes, and I, I believe this is a very interesting uh, result. It tells us what's the order of magnitude of the, uh, that we can expect for the recombination processes, at least due to phonons, and, yeah, starts to go beyond from the pure uh, intrinsic uh, property. Well, just wanted to mention that. But okay, coming back to the Van interpolation. So how do we do? Uh, what's the strategy? So we already saw that um, in Vanier you can, well, you select windows, you try to Vanierize um, uh, the, the states that you, you, uh, you select. 
the strategy is to do k.p perturbation theory within a subspace of a vanierized band. So in practice, one chooses an energy window uh, where the excitations that um, you want to um, check out will happen. So for instance, say you are interested in checking the spectrum in the uh, two to four electron volt range. Well, then this subspace uh, will suffice you. And you do k.p perturbation there and compute the matrix elements. So we are going to review the method a little bit in detail, and this, is, uh, this was put forward, uh, especially in these uh, two papers uh, by uh, the same authors. Okay, let's go. So I hope you were in the talk of uh, David Vanderbilt, because he explained nicely many of these things. We'll go slowly. Okay, the equation on the top. Um, you remember, well, I'm going to write, um, I know that usually the, the standard way of writing the rotation matrix between uh, Hamiltonian gauge block functions and Vanier uh, gauge block functions is a U matrix, but since these are already used, I decided to use S because otherwise we would be full of use. So now the matrix, the rotation matrix is S. So what are these two type of functions? So this you can imagine as the typical block function that you compute right uh, in an ab initio code, the one that uh, pick up the, the code that you like, quantum express or siesta. So you get a wave function. If you try to plot it in k space, that is you pick up a point in real space and you vary it in k space, you will see something like that. So typically these functions are not smooth with respect to k. And this is because of this um, phase indeterminacy or gauge freedom that you have in choosing the, the phase that multiplies, the k-space uh, phase that multiplies your wave function. So without any uh, procedure, this will look something like that. Now, what the Vanier procedure is really is turning these type of functions, performing a unitary matrix rotations in a way that this rotated wave functions, although not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian anymore, now if you pick up a point in real space and vary it in k space, you will have something smooth. And smooth in k space is nice, because you can, uh, you can think of, okay, if I have something smooth, I could interpolate, because uh, I know that two neighboring points are well connected, and you can even think of taking derivatives, which uh, we, are, we will be very much interested in. We saw how this is done, so this is the um, minimization procedure that uh, David Vanderbilt uh, mentioned. That's how you actually choose. Uh, the thing is how you know how to choose this matrix, right? So that's uh, how you do it. It's the localization, uh, Marzari Vanderbilt localization functional, but we won't go into details. So let's check how the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian look like. And this we will call a normal operator uh, for reasons that will become uh, clear afterwards. So we have two sets, right? Hamiltonian, um, call it gauge, uh, Vanier gauge. If you start from the Hamiltonian gauge, you have um, the, uh, the sandwich of your Hamiltonian between uh, its eigenstates, but you can rewrite it using this expression in terms of the Vanier um, block functions, and you will uh, get the rotation matrices here. So written in matrix notation, the way to go from Hamiltonian to Vanier gauge is just applying the rotation matrices. This is just what we would expect for in the normal case, right? You go from one set to the other, uh, applying this type of matrices. Okay, now, a quick reminder of uh, how Vanier functions were defined. This is, you can think of them basically as a Fourier transform from K space to real space. So this is the definition, and it's in the Vanier gauge that we connect to the Vanier functions, okay? And the K dependence node goes only in this uh, phase factor, in the exponential. So that's why it's a, a Fourier transform, basically. Now what's done in Vanier is to rewrite this matrix element uh, this matrix element uh, in terms of the money functions. You plug this in, you take into account that, well, this R and notation is uh, for the money function, sorry, R would uh, indicate which um, unit cell you are, so R0 would be the home unit cell, 
and we still have a band index that connects to the band index, band index of the Vani function. So you plug this expression in, and what you get on one hand is that the position goes away, and you end up with something like that. So you've got now the Hamiltonian written explicitly in the basis of Vani functions. Now we know that Vani functions tend to be localized in real space. So you can expect and hope that uh, to describe properly this type of matrix element with just the use of a few Vani functions. So the more localized your Vani functions, the fewer you might be able to use. And note a very nice thing here. So now, this doesn't depend on k at all. k only goes here. So if you have a good description of this type of matrix element, and now you want to obtain uh, quantities in uh, k space, like band structure, you want a very fine band structure, you don't have to compute it ab initio. You just plug whatever k you want here, and if this is sufficiently localized, the thing that you get in k space uh, will, be, will be nice, and you will have a very fine sampling of your k space mesh. And a further uh, advantage is, is that now taking derivatives of this type of um, matrix elements is very easy. If you think of um, the k space derivative of the matrix element, as said, k only goes here, so it will bring down um, a component of, the, of this R vector, but that's it. You will be able to compute this type of k space derivatives of your matrix element with the same matrix element in Vanier basis. So that's also very convenient. Um, gonna ask, is everything clear at this point? Any question? Okay, so everything super clear. Uh, okay, so then we continue. Um, yeah. So I got a bit lost of what is uh, smooth and what is not. So the the H U the first in the first row that is uh, of course not not smooth no that, that is what it comes out from uh, from the DFT code. Yeah, that's me trying to draw something that is not smooth. <laughs> okay, then the the vanier use yeah they are smooth because you know the this this sum over R, right no? you know forgot the face. yeah sorry I forgot to repeat what so the argument that David did in his talk so. Usually, we, uh, we said that the relation between Vanier and uh, these block functions in Vanier gauge and the Vanier functions is just a Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform has a property that the more localized in one of the sides, the, the smoother in the other side. So the localization of the Vanier functions translates into smoothness of the uh, rotated block functions. The more localized the Vanier functions, the smoother the block functions. And it's a um, sort of mathematical property. Okay, but in the end, you, you still have to diagonalize the, the small Vanier Hamiltonian, and you introduce another extra phase, no? Or you doesn't? Mm, or you don't? Sorry. No, I wouldn't say. So you say that the okay. diagonalization procedure introduces... Yeah, so in the end, you diagonalize your, uh, let's say, a small or, or Vanier Hamiltonian in k-space. Mm -hmm. That, that's a matrix yeah. for every k, and do you diagonalize it? Yeah. So the well, vectors in the Vanier base are, are, in principle, they also have... No, you actually, so we don't diagonalize it. What we do is we compute, so the way to work in Vanier basis is you can even uh, start out of a tight binding Hamiltonian. Once you have the, this would be, in, by the way, in tight binding language, these are the tunneling coefficients, right? So if you've got the tunneling coefficients, you don't need to diagonalize. You just go. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. You you get for the matrix. Yeah, that's right. Yes. But okay. that doesn't introduce any um, extra phase. Okay. Let's say. So that's actually yeah how you get. You can think of these as matrices as the ones that. Um, get you the diagonal bits, because this is diagonal, of course, this is um, the diagonal bits of these are the energy eigenvalues, the ones that diagonalize this H matrix, yes. So, but if in the end you get a, a smooth eigenvector, why can't you just compute the, the, this derivative that you wanted to compute? That you can now, no? Yes, that's uh, what we do. 
Okay. You mean why for why don't we apply k derivative directly if, here? If in the end you have a, a smooth solution, and in the beginning you wanted to compute some k derivative of the uh, this generalized derivative, you can do it now, no? Because the yeah, now now we can do it. Now we are coming to that. Okay. okay. Now we are coming to that. So okay. the gen yeah. So the generalized derivative now has these extra k derivatives, right? And we saw that it depends on the very connection. But then you don't need to use any sum rule, no? To compute no. It. no, 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 no. Okay. Right. Okay. So the sum rule, yeah. So a nice thing of this approach will be that we won't use any sum rule. So we won't be uh, needing any uh, sum over virtual states. What we are doing is we are recasting the problem in the subspace of the vanierized bands. And we are using um, yeah, the overlapping um, of the block functions at different k points as initial um, entities to then compute this matrix element. So the whole thing uh, boils down to compute this type of matrix elements for the Hamiltonian in one hand. And then we'll now see that for the, what happens to the Berry connection, right? And that's an special um, operator, if you want. Um, why? Well, because the Berry connection by itself contains a k-space derivative of the block functions in Hamiltonian gauge. Now, if you check our relation of the Hamiltonian gauge to the Vanier gauge, that is the rotation matrix, so if we want to co start computing these type of things, now, not only we are going to need to apply the matrix to the operator itself, but we are going to need to make, take a derivative of the matrix itself, right? Because it will act on the block function, and then uh, since that one uh, depends on the matrix and it's k-dependent, then we need to take care of this extra term. So to go from one gauge to the other, we need uh, to take care of this extra term. This, by the way, a very similar expression was shown in uh, John's talk. Luckily, this extra term can be computed in terms of the derivatives of the Hamiltonian. I'm not going to prove it, but you just can think uh, precisely what we were saying, that the S matrix is especially that that takes you from Hamiltonian to Vanier gauge, uh, that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian in Vanier gauge. So, we, yeah, so that's how you end up uh, being able to compute this derivative of the matrix in terms of the matrix elements of the derivative of the Hamiltonian and some energy uh, differences. So this we can compute, just that one has to be a bit more careful with this type of um, matrix elements, because now we have to take care of this. Term. And now, in the same fashion as we were doing with the Hamiltonian, we'll have this uh, piece, which if you see, acts on the Vanier block function. We check how it depends. So it will be acting on K. So this will bring down the position operator. That's how the position operator ends up here. So now, the matrix element that we need to compute the very connection in Vanier gauge, it's the one <laughs> of the position. This, in usually in tight binding, this is an, assumed to be a diagonal uh, piece in the in the band indexes and the uh, special vectors, but here we have all sorts of uh, off diagonal terms. And again, once you get this matrix element, you can get this quantity as fine as you want in K space by just interpolating uh, this Fourier transform and inserting here the K that you want. What matrix element do we need for the shift current? Well, the additional ones are K space derivatives of this uh, quantity. But the, in the same way that it was happening for the Hamiltonian, we can take very easily the k-space derivatives. It, it just will bring down one of the components of this R vector. But at the end of the day, will be enough to live with that, this type of uh, matrix element. So that's how you end up now interpolating uh, nonlinear processes like the shift current using Vanier interpolation. So again, I'm going to ask if there is some question. I can repeat. Well, okay. Uh, so, now, but I, oh. okay. now it means that um, if I compute the diagonal elements here in the Vanier basis, 
of the very connection, I will get something that in the block basis, I cannot do it. That's what you're saying? Can you repeat, please? So in the, in the block basis, if I try to compute the very connection. You mean in the Hamiltonian basis? Yes. Basic, basically, if I try to compute the diagonal elements of the very connection, mm -hmm. I cannot do it because my position operator is undefined there. But then if I go to the Vanier basis, I'm supposed to get something there. Um, I mean, you will get, but it's not, so the, the ones that we are looking for uh, are uh, of diagonal because those are the ones that will enter. So to remember, our expression was going into a, um, let's say it's an optical pump effect that will have your uh, occupation factors between the initial and final states. And so the ones that we will be interested in are the off-diagonal ones. So with the diagonal ones, you still have to be careful. Mm -hmm. I see. So in the, but in the formula, you still have this, this ANN, AMM uh, terms, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so if there is no any more question, we'll, uh, so this was the um, <coughs> explanation a little bit of the Vani interpolation procedure. Uh, the bit of the shift photocurrent, uh, so we worked it out together with uh, Stepan and Ivo um, a few years ago. Uh, you can also check this paper that uh, does essentially the same in a bit different uh, way. And at the end of the day, this uh, troublesome quantity, uh, it's re-expressed in terms of just two matrix elements. So there are many terms that will be involved in the calculation of this covariant derivative, but at the end of the day, you will li be leaving and needing only Hamiltonian and position matrix element in Vanier space. That's the, the nice thing about it. Um, that, these are the properties that I was mentioning. So it's an exact treatment of the sum of stage contribution, so there is no truncation error and you can have an efficient calculation uh, that allows you to go up to a million points, yes, because it's an uh, interpolation procedure. If you use the vanier berry code, even more, because it uses a fast Fourier transform algorithm and, and symmetry um, properties. And it's implemented both in the Vanier 90 code and in vanier berry uh, This is a plot trying to uh, summarize how for large integration uh, grid sizes, the Vanier method, it's much faster than, than the direct. Of course, if few, uh, you just need a few K points, you probably doesn't pay off to go th uh, through the, to go through the uh, whole Vanierization procedure and Vanier interpolation, but if you are interested in having a fine sampling, then um, it's something to think about. And I just wanted to add that uh, recently we've uh, been also working on uh, introducing many body corrections to, to this method, and we have especially tried to do it in the context of Vani functions in order to include these many body effects in a scheme that allows you still to interpolate, so we don't want, want to lose the, the ability to interpolate it in case space. And that's the reference if somebody's interested, but I'm not talking uh, about it today. Okay, so that was the scheme, and since I see no questions, let's move on to uh, the applications. We'll uh, check out two examples that we've um, studied recently. So the first one is dipole selection rules in graphitic BC2N. Okay. Right, okay, so material. Uh, graphitic BC2N, it's a, well, it's composed of weakly coupled layer. It's a semiconductor. And because it is uh, composed of weakly coupled layers, we hope that its properties are quasi 2D. And since we've seen that uh, there is an uh, enhancement in 2D materials of the shift photoconductivity, we hope that the shift current that we can expect in this material is large. Actually, there is some debate on uh, which is the structure that this uh, material crystallizes. There are several polytypes that have been proposed. You can check this reference um, if you want to find out more. The calculations that I'm going to show are done in the so-called A2 polytype, that is the um, energetically most favorable one that doesn't have inversion uh, symmetry. The other proposed candidate does have inversion symmetry, so uh, one could think that a nice way of checking what's the actually synthesized uh, structure is 
measuring an effect that uh, can only be measured if the uh, material is inversion, uh, well, is eccentric. So you could get something if it's eccentric, you wouldn't get anything if, if it is not. Okay, uh, right, the structure is uh, like graphene, but uh, in some of the stripes, instead of having carbon again, we have a zigzag chain of uh, boron and nitrate uh, atoms. Okay, that's a little bit of the band structure that it has. So I said it's a semiconductor, and the gap doesn't lie at a high symmetry point, but it lies in the middle of the SX line. It's here, it's around 1.2 electron volts as, uh, as it comes out from the calculations. And we then see that at the X point, uh, we again get uh, a bit of a flat, uh, flatness of the, of the band because this other type of transition start to kick in. That's uh, gonna be important. Okay, that's the calculated results. I'm showing you now the photoconductivity for two of the allowed components, the YYY and YXX. So I call this a large man magnitude for a semiconductor. So it's on the order of uh, 60 microampere per volt square. And this is, uh, for instance, I believe, um, twice what's uh, measured in barium titanate. So the, respon the response is uh, indeed large. And it peaks in the suitable uh, energy range. So it looks like an interesting material. But more interesting from the fundamental point of view is um, to check out that in the bandage region, while one of the components starts to grow a lot, the other one still remains virtually zero and only starts to grow after this EX energy is hit. So let's think about it. Well, those, what are these two components? One of these uh, components, the YYY, the one that doesn't grow, means that we apply um, electric field along Y axis and we collect current along Y axis. So it's a parallel setup. The more common one. But the other one is the perpendicular one. We, we apply field in the x direction and we measure current in the y direction. And that's the one that grows a lot. And in principle, realize that uh, space group symmetry says that both are allowed to have finite values. But it seems that in the bandage region, one of them doesn't. So why? Well, we're going to see that actually this is um, an effect of a quantum dipole selection rule that is well known in linear optics, but uh, to our knowledge, this was not uh, applied to shift current, but it can be. So to understand this, we need to look a little bit uh, uh, to the symmetries of the system, especially the mirror symmetry that this system has um, that takes x to minus x. So the system is uh, symmetric under uh, x minus uh, x mirror. Now, being symmetric, having a mirror symmetry means that along the lines um, in K space that are invariant uh, with respect to this symmetry, your bandage states, apart from being eigenstates of your Hamiltonian, will also be eigenstates of this uh, symmetry. So it, they will have definite mirror parity, the eigenvalue of uh, the mirror uh, operator. And this mirror parity can take on two possible eigenvalues, either plus or minus. And this is something that one needs to go and compute. Uh, we did that, and it turns out that in this case, the valence band uh, has negative parity, and the um, conduction band has uh, positive parity. So the two have opposite parities. And importantly, the bandage lies in a mirror invariant line. So it's in a very special uh, location. So if we now take a closer look to the expression of the shift current, so we know that the dipole enters through this term. This is the covariant derivative, but we are now only going to do look at the dipole. So there are two um, cases that one can distinguish depending on the parity, uh, relative parity actually, of the uh, valence and conduction bands. So if the states have same parity, then dipole selection rules, if we apply them, tells us that the X component of the uh, dipole matrix element needs to vanish. But if the states have opposite parity, it's the Y component that needs to vanish. So this is a different situation, because if we now um, work out what this means for the, for the shift current, this tells us that the, in this case, the perpendicular setup needs to vanish, that is, if we apply the field in the perpendicular direction uh, to where we are measuring the current, we will obtain zero. 
And in the other case, it's uh, the opposite case. It's the parallel configuration that is forbidden by these dipole selection rules. And in retrospective, this was what was happening in uh, the 2D material that we uh, showed initially. This is the monolayer germanium sulfate that was worked out in these two references falls into that category. The two states have same parity. But the one uh, that we studied, and you can find more information in this paper, um, and it's sort of more exotic because usually you are not used to getting current um, with the applied field being perpendicular to it. It's not a Howl effect because it's not a perpendicular um, intrinsically, so it, it just means that if you apply current along x, you will get, uh, or you apply fill along x, you will get um, current along y, but if you tilt it, it won't be perpendicular. It, just the, it will give you just the contribution, um, only the contribution along x will give you current and it will be along y. Don't sure, I'm not sure if this was super clear, but uh, if uh, there is doubt, you can ask me. Okay, so yeah, any questions? <laughs> So you're saying that in uh, 2D materials, the shift photocurrent is enhanced, right? The photoconductivity, well, yeah. There are subtleties, so you can imagine the photoconductivity um, has usually uh, units of ampere per volt square, but when you compute uh, or a 2D material, really it's not a bulk material, right? It's a very thin layer. So actually when you compute values, you need kind of um, renormalize the results. So the 3D value of a 2D material, the 3D photoconductivity, turns out to be large, yes. And is it something that you can generalize for any 2D material? Or let's say if I have material A in, in two dimensions and material B in 3D, um, could you say that for any 2D material it will be much larger than in 3D? No, I couldn't no? say. Uh, so the enhancement or large part of the enhancement in 2D materials comes from a density of states uh, contribution. It's just that the, um, the density of states has Van Hoff singularities, and that enters into the expression, so this pushes and enhances the, the response. But note that photoconductivity is not the same as photocurrent. If you want to compute the total current that you would generate, you have to take into account um, practical aspects like uh, the geometry of the device and, and things that might, uh, so if a, even though a system might look uh, from the photoconductivity point of view uh, interesting, you also have to in, uh, take into account absorption of light through the glass coefficient, so there are more things. So saying things in general is hard, I think, in general. Yeah. So, so the, the sigma term you've calculated comes from mixing omega with minus omega. Sorry? The sigma term that you've calculated here, right? This comes from mixing, if I think of yep. the, the omega with yep. minus omega. <clears throat> if you looked at something like second harmonic generation, mm -hmm. you would mix omega with omega. Mm -hmm. Would Have you looked at how this would play out with that? We have not, I, but... I always thought, so I have in mind the expression for the matrix elements for second harmonic, and they have lots of terms. So they are, yeah. it's way more complicated than the shift current. So I would guess that even if some of the terms maybe would, because at the end here, what you want to do is kill some terms, right? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not sure if you could kill off all of them, all but no, the we, didn't, we didn't check that. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, I think I'm going to move on since we have, yeah, 15 minutes. So last uh, example, uh, it's variety of nonlinear responses in vile semimetal tantalonirin tetratelurum. Uh, this is a work we've done uh, recently, mm, and it will involve some few responses beyond the shift photoconductivity. Uh, the main work, by the way, has been done by uh, Alvaro, a PhD student that he's here. So, uh, right, the motivation for this work is actually an experimental paper that was uh, published recently. It's this one. Um, and basically, well, they are shining light and measuring uh, photocurrent, as in this figure. 
the x-axis is the power that um, they imprint on the electric field, the power of the electric field. So there are two different regimes. The low power regime shows, and the one that we are going to focus is the low power regime, shows a very large um, increase in photocurrent uh, at very low powers. And the number that uh, is extracted from here, in this case it's photoresponsivity, but it's uh, very much linked to photoconductivity, ranks among largest photoresponses uh, reported to date. This is, I believe, at 0.3 electron volts. So it's a very large response. Uh, this LPA means that it's linearly polarized light along uh, the A direction, or well, I believe it's X. Uh, they get a bit less response on other directions, and they also get a little bit of response for circularly polarized light. But the main response is to linearly polarized light, and it's very large. You can see the polar plot uh, computed here uh, looks, uh, has an elongated shape along this A direction. So, okay, it's a type 2 vial semi metal, this um, type T. So, we set up to uh, compute actually the nonlinear optical properties of this material. So, let's have a few basic facts before beginning. So, it's a, again, type 2 vial semi metal. Space group is PMN2. It's eccentric. Uh, and it's got four metallic bands, as you can see here. So it's a, a wide uh, gap insulator in much of the brilliant zone, but close to the Y and gamma points, we've got four metallic bands. Two of, uh, these are two spin split uh, vial bands, actually. And two pairs of vial points are in the KC equals zero plane that are, and the vial point, it's around 70 millielectron volts above the Fermi level. So the vial point is uh, unoccupied and above the Fermi level. Now we are going to compute the shift current, but uh, rather than showing you the spectrum, I'm going to show you, I think, um, to understand a little bit more, um, a k-space plot of the transition matrix elements. This is this figure, um, psychedelic figure. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is this type of matrix element uh, between the two uh, vial bands, okay? So this tells us what's the magnitude of the probability for transitions between the two vial bands that actually cross the Fermi level. So these are going to be important for the response. The vial points are located in these four points, and we see a huge increase on the matrix element, so uh, on the probability of transition, right at the vial one. So this means that the shift current is greatly enhanced around the um, vial points. But we saw that um, those for are actually unoccupied. So this is the pure um, mat transition matrix element map. But if we now apply the occupation factors, those are unfortunately not available. So transitions uh, between the vial uh, bands at the vial points are not allowed by uh, occupation factors. So they cannot contribute to the response uh, at this order. This was already realized in the paper, and that's why even in the abstract they mention that the large response is arising from third order nonlinear optical response. Um, the way they inferred that, uh, well, it's in various ways, but experimentally, it turns out they are measuring an in-plane component in the AB um, in the AB plane, but the shift current doesn't have, at second order, any component that has purely in-plane components, all of them, that is allowed by symmetry. So it has to be some other effect, and uh, the next in order, it's a third order effect. So what we, are, we're, what we are going to be looking at, it's this type of response. Not any third order effect, but um, a combination of electric fields that is from light, that between omega and minus omega, the one that gives rise to the shift current, in the presence of an static electric field. So this type of situation was already uh, explained by John uh, in the general context of um, nonlinear responses. The origin of this electric, this electric field in the experimental work is argued to be a built-in effect. So you can imagine, well, a static electric field, you can get, if you, well, uh, for instance, if you apply the pulse 
and you have a photothermoelectric effect or um, some uh, interfacial effect is um, creating different electronic uh, neighborhoods and uh, that would create another DC electric field. Anyway, this is, one needs to assume that uh, the presence of an electric, uh, static electric field. Okay, so let's work under that assumption. What are the possibilities for, um, that we have for um, getting contributions to this type of current? So you can think of, semi-classically, a static electric field. The basic thing that it would do is to modify a little bit your occupation factors, right? So now your uh, occupation factor at K will have a shifted um, new K prime um, wave vector that um, will be dependent on the direction and the magnitude of the electric field as well as the uh, relaxation time. If you do a Taylor expansion around that, if you suppose that the electric field is small, you will end up with this type of um, expression and now you see that we popped down the electric field. So if you now plug this expression for the occupation factors into the expression for the shift current, for instance, you will get a linear dependence on the electric field. So now it will become a third order effect with modified um, occupation factors that actually will only contribute very close to the Fermi level. This is very similar to the uh, nonlinear Hall effect, uh, non effect that we were uh, discussing yesterday. We've got K derivatives of the occupation factor, so this will make sure that only states close to the Fermi level will now contribute. So in this case, the new uh, contribution will have different symmetry con um, properties, and it turns out that this type of current-induced um, contributions now would have shift as well as injection currents could contribute to linearly uh, polarized light. But this would only be a Fermi surface effect, so we set to consider another effect that it would be intrinsic that was worked by uh, again John <laughs> very recently, and this is the so-called jerk current. Jerk, because it's a, I think the jerk is the derivative of the acceleration, if I'm not wrong, that's where the name comes from. And so John and co-workers worked out a, um, how the expression for the transition matrix elements of this type of response would look like, uh, well, quantum mechanically. Now, this is not a Fermi surface effect. Now, this is the intrinsic band structure effect that uh, would look like that. It's very similar, in some sense, to the expression of the injection current, instead that it, it, uh, except that it is not anti-symmetric, but it involves, again, derivatives of the energy differences. In this, uh, in this case, it's a second derivative, so this would measure the effective mass or the inverse effective mass of your bands. But otherwise, you just have dipoles. So this is no big issue to, to compute. It's a, it has a, a classical, uh, semi-classical interpretation, so one can actually compute this type of matrix elements. That's what we did, and compared the three competing effects. Now we have current-induced injection and shift currents, and jerk current. Uh, sorry, forgot to mention, <coughs> this turns out to be second order on the scattering time. So, to estimate what would be the contribution of each of these uh, pieces to the photocurrent, to the DC photocurrent, one also, of course, needs to estimate the magnitude of the electric field, um, built-in electric field, as well as the relaxation time. These are conservative estimates that are provided, for instance, in the experimental <coughs> work that I was quoting, and here are the results. So the experimental data is these black dots, and then we've got the three components, but note that we have multiplied by a factor 100 and a factor 10 to the 7, the injection and shift currents. So the shift current, according to our calculation, doesn't really, um, it's not a li likely candidate to uh, be responsible for this effect. And partly this is because the Fermi, uh, the vial points that could actually contribute a lot to the, to the effect lie according to our calculations, too high in uh, energy so that even a, elect a static electric field could not make transitions to the vial points uh, accessible. Of course, that could change if uh, the Fermi level would change or our estimates are not correct. But as long as you don't um, 
bring into play the contribution from the vital points, you don't get a uh, big enhancement. But you don't need. Normal bands can also do uh, nice stuff, and this is what the injection and gear current show. You don't need uh, that huge enhancement around the vital points. You can uh, get uh, some response on the order of what's been measured. Of course, here um, the um, scattering processes are uh, included in a sort of uh, crude approximation, but it's, a, it's an estimate, and it's uh, quite hopeful that the shape is uh, quite nicely gotten both by the jerk and the injection contributions. So, okay, I left here the, the reference if somebody is uh, interested, and I think with that I will uh, finish. So if you have more questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Thank you. We are all tired. Um, so, what would be like a limit of the position of the wire points to actually the contribution being relevant? Uh, yeah, nice question. Um, I mean, so let's see. To estimate, right here, to estimate what's the K shift, uh, it's the product between tau and E0 that comes into play, right? And for uh, reasonable estimates, this was around, I believe, a hundredth of an angstrom, more or less. So if you then go to band structure and measure, well, uh, I guess it would have to be uh, around 10 MeV, maybe. But of course, I mean, we are doing a initio here. Uh, it's a complicated uh, structure. Um, it might be that uh, in reality, the vial points are actually closer to to the Fermi level and that uh, they, they do contribute uh, with thermal effects and so on. But yeah, around that uh, energy, I guess. Yeah, two questions actually. The first is with the assumption of a built-in DC field yeah. will also in principle lead to a change in the linear optical properties. Yeah, is Is that... Can that be measured? Is there any sensitivity to that? Right. Um, I'm not aware uh, that this was reported uh, experimentally, and I hadn't thought about it. Um, but it's a nice point. Um, I don't know, but okay. it would be nice to... Okay. Yeah, I, uh, about it. I yeah. think, you know, but it's, it's a nice way. So one would, big question here is whether really the built-in electric field is there and how big it is. And yeah. this could be a way yeah. of estimating, right? Okay. Second question, um, in the, when you plotted the enhanced uh, business around the vial point, yeah. for you, you plotted, I think, the product of the matrix element yeah. and its covariant derivative. Are they both enhanced or is one of them enhanced more than the other or? Uh, um, you know, how do I understand that enhancement? Is it, does it have to do with the actual shift motion or does it have to do with the, the injection process? So I want to say this should be on the covariant because if you check the same plot for, say, linear conductivity, which would have the dipoles, yeah. you don't see such an enhancement, neither for injection. Um, but, of course, this product is um, real. And, yeah, but yeah. Uh, the covariant derivative by itself is not so plotting it. It's uh, yeah, analyzing, but yeah. it's the covariant derivative. Yeah. Co uh, so, has to go there. So then, can one get any? So that that would say that the actual shift distance is enhanced. Yeah. Can one look at the structure where the charges are and so on, and, right. and sort of see why that shift distance? I mean, I know this is not what what yeah. one's seen, but just you know. Um, can one understand why the shift distance would be so large? So, would you be suggesting to compute the shift vector or the shift distance? Uh, the shift distance. Well, both, but yeah. But because for the shift distance, we yeah. would need um, to occup occupy them, right? I mean, to, to right, but drive real transitions. So do right. a fake. Uh, but you right. know, just maybe one could pretend that they're occupied or right. something, right? Just to understand why. Why, if you could occupy it somehow, and maybe the experimentalists can someday, somehow, you know, why, why that shift, why it would be so large? Right. You know? One thing I would like you to note 
it's, uh, the structure around the vial points actually has positive and negative contributions. So the scale is ah. logarithmic, but in this case, it turns out that uh, depending on when you, where you approach, this is, uh, turns out to be not um, plain uh, one type of contribution. So I see. Uh, the magnitude seems to be enhanced. In, uh, looks like it has a, some sort of uh, sink or, well, hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, but it would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. 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 Hi, um, I have a question about the relaxation time. How do you estimate the relaxation time in such nonlinear effects? Um, so this is taken, so this uh, is not, let's say, done uh, thinking in nonlinear effects. It's just taken based on uh, the few measurements of the relaxation time that there are in different metals. And the value we took is just quoted in the experiment as a likely candidate. But I agree that there is a big uh, uncertainty there. It could be one order more, one order less. It's, it's a big uh, uh, unknown. Okay, thanks. But yeah, based on earlier measurements in a way. Uh, sorry, one basic question. I, because we learned that for topological, uh, for materials with a churn number, uh, we cannot uh, have localized linear functions. Yep. Now we have the Fermi level at the uh, the wild points, and I'm wondering if uh, we can easily. Uh, I mean, you calculate the matrix uh, or matrix elements with the method that you described, mm. and how do the linear functions look like then? Are they? Um, well, this is one part. So thanks for the question. Um, so this obstruction to construct a bunny function, if uh, that's what you were meaning, takes place if the net chair number of your material, uh, of your subspace, it's finite. And in this case, it is not. So we don't have any problem in that sense. Uh -huh. Okay. And then how do they look like? Usually, um, so David explained that um, in the procedure for constructing bunny functions, there, is, there are initial uh, trial orbitals. So it's nice to have an initial guess on what uh, orbitals contribute to your states, especially the ones that you're interested in. So usually, if you did a nice work uh, and know which orbitals contribute close to the energy region that you're interested in, the Vanier functions when would end up looking something alike, but um, orthonormal. Yes, yes, I understand. Yeah. But localized uh, yeah, around the different atoms. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.